get some walk up music. Some hype music. We're gonna be doing Tommy Lynch's sort of mini triple, drunk and disorderly. Um couple things about this fly. Uh one it's it's my favorite fly to tie. Um which is really I like to tie flies. And <clears throat> a couple reasons why is that um you know I, I can think about some of the eats and the follows. There's also just the action that I have in my brain. And then you, you can do this from this is a six and a size one. Um and then you know four and a size one, four with a longer middle shank, um, size one odd, two odd up front. Um, you, you know, you can go up to four odd if you if you feel like it. You might want to start casting that on a, a fast action eight. Um, I spent so much time trying to get this thing right and I didn't get it right for a long time and listening to him on some podcasts and watching him to there was just there's some degree of simplicity that I was clearly missing because I mean, some of some of it is deer hair and just that takes time to get comfortable with once you do get comfortable with it it's it really is not a complicated fly and that's one of the reasons i like to tie it because you get so much out of this thing for a relatively simple tie you know it's just a couple of ingredients it's flash and feathers on the back no feathers and in, in the standard uh, mallard flanks rabbit and polar chenille and then you know the deer hair head I like to put as big of a rattle as I can in there. So, um, I encourage you to tie this, tie a bunch, and, and probably see that they're not working right. Um, but a couple things to, to focus on when fishing them is go so small on your strips, just these little... I just put this up on Instagram and I, the hashtag was tap, tap, tap a Cause I think of the Billy Madison quote, just tap it in. Cause it, this is, especially if you're fishing current, it's just these little pop, pop, pop. And once you start getting, you know, you start getting the dog walk and once you're starting to get the dog walk, it's also digging down and you don't need to that that's you know fishing this on the i'm putting words in his mouth but fishing this on the pm up in michigan and and hitting these pockets that you know aren't giant relative to some of the stuff that i'm fishing on these tailwaters and you're you're getting the presentation that you get is i don't know 10 15 20 times the he he always says there's you know, it's it's five types of action to, you know, a jig flies or a strip flies one, um, and and I beg to differ. I think it's it's more because you're getting all you're getting the side to side, you're getting these kills, you're getting the jig going down, you're getting the float recovery coming back up. But the the hang when you kill it, and this is why I love time with your hair so much. When you kill it, it it stops dead in its tracks you know that that head might get pushed a little bit but it's also coming up and then the rest of this and same with the standard with just just the mallard flank no feathers on the back you just get this wiggle in the back and every time you kill it it's, so you just these little tap tap taps it's just hanging there so you're getting all of this action but you're not moving it it's it's moving quickly so that's one of the things that i harp on with um, fishing streamers on my boat is 
not everything being fast, but when you're moving it, it's fast. And I like fast and short. So every time you're moving it, minnows, injured, sculpin, whatever, they're not moving slowly. It's really short, fast strips that kill. You can extend that, you know, painfully long. I'd say as long as you want, but you probably still wouldn't kill it for very long. But when it's moving, it's very, very fast. This is because you just give it these little pop. It, it goes down, it's coming back up, it's going side to side. So the, the, the distance that it covers, and I, w I will get technical, I guess you can call it technical on this one, um, distance over time, that's speed. In the same amount of time, pop, you're getting you know down side to side, coming back up. It's doing a lot of stuff in a really short amount of time and a short amount of distance. And then, you know, kill, it's coming back up. You do it again, coming back up. So you get to, you know, make a fish eat three, four, five, six times just in a couple feet. And, you know, fishing these tailwaters with not just pockets, but, you know, you're getting these pools. And, and even in faster water, you're, there's a lot of slack water relative to currents. And there's just a lot of space to elicit and eat um, and you know odds are it's going to be closer to the bank but when the current starts to get uniform they're going to start coming out more and in, in some of the frog water especially with that rattle um, the, the he, he calls it the sales pitch but the, the ability to sell something and, and find whatever trigger it is that's going to make a fish eat you this just covers so many you know, it checks so many boxes that to not to not have this in your box and to not fish frog water, same with two handing changers. Doing the stuff that, you know, one isn't done and and two, especially in that more open water, presents something that is big enough and 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 moving in a way that is going to elicit an eat from a fish that might n not eat otherwise. Um, you, you just, to, <laughs> to, to go through some of that water or just assume there's no fish there because you're not catching it, you know, stripping single articulated weighted flies and you've never seen anything, you know, size up, extend those kills. Um, with the changers, you know, two handing that stuff. And, you know, it's at the end of the day for me, a lot of this is just exploring different ways to fish. And most of it for me, just because I like fishing a lot, is fun. Um, the, then, you know, side benefit or benefit in total for a lot of people is actually getting a fish to eat. Um, but it's just, it, it's a good way to change your presentation up. And this presentation, and you can fish this all day, but this presentation is just so vastly different than your typical strip flies. And, you know, I, I think of these videos that I see on Instagram of just, you know, a white, it looks like a white line just being pulled through the water and the fish comes out and smashes it. And that's, I'll say it, a million times swing an olive woolly bugger through anything long enough and you're gonna get an eat it might not be in a day but if you go back there you know cloud cover barometer dropping all that fun stuff and you and you put it in the kill zone at the right time the fish is gonna smash it and if you have a drone you're gonna get it on film it doesn't really matter about the presentation this expands that that feed window to not just the bitey days and not just the, the good zones. Um, you, you, I started seeing before I moved to Tennessee, before I was guiding wade fishing. That's when I started streamer fishing, wade fishing, small creeks up in Pennsylvania. Um, I started seeing fish come out and follow to my feet when, when I was getting this dialed in. And again, it took 
hundreds and hundreds um, of hours and flies, and this was, you know, easily over an hour to tie when I first started tying. And most of them turned out to be junk. So it's it's a learning curve. It's just part of the, the process of, you know, investing in, in fly tying. Um, but it, it does pay off. Just it's exciting to fish, and it also it gets eats. So I'll, I'll put a link to a couple different podcasts and, and his time video Schultz and possibly keep all of this. We'll see. Get to time though. So we're going to do Size 6, Gammy B10S. Using 140, you can feel free to use GSP the whole time. Doesn't super matter what you're going with here. I like gold holographic, this opal. Mirror, whatever. Pepper, where are you? Krennic. Krennic actually has a little bit of bulk to it relative to this other flash of so you can not worry about putting too much there. You can be a little more efficient, judicious, 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 there we go, judicious with your flash, if you'd like, by taking out half the amount and then doubling it over and not, not tying in that piece, but that's, that's not where I'm at this morning. I'm gonna get fancy with the feathers. Use some. That was. Those are just some Chinese hackle. Oh, whiting. This is the content. Everyone has been looking for. These are off a of whiting American rooster dyed. Got it and just grizzly and dyed some sort of dark marigold. Nope. Take the fluff out. These are three inches. Yeah, 
if you're having issues with tying your hackles on, you can put both on at once with the stems flat, you know, pinched together up on top. And you're going to get generally the same effect if you want them to splay out a little more after you're done tying them in, you know, spread them out a little bit. And while you're holding them, you can put a little UV flex on there and they'll just, they'll stay kicked out like that. Too many thread wraps. Cool with that. Put my feathers away so I don't have shit on my lap. You know, colors. Uh, I'm I'm really olive, tan, and white are really the the go tos for me. You can screw around with, you know, orange and hot yellows. And I think I'm going to put orange, some orange mallard flanks on this as kind of an accent. Um, but I, I found that olive, tan, and white work. I like seeing flies. Look at this, I'm gonna put stuff away after I use it. We are ripping. typically do copper polar chenille on just about everything so I, I tied a bug yesterday that it's kind of the same color scheme I would put in copper and put in silver and I, I dig it does it matter yes because I think it looks cool Whenever I'm using rabbit strips, just a little, just like on the surface. And if you see what I did there, I'm, the threads here, on this last one, I'm wrapping around the thread. So I'm coming in front of it, up and over. And that allows me to then take my thread and come up and over the rabbit strip like that. Now I'm secured. Between that super glue and the the 140 not GSP that you know it stretches and, and cinches down. Um, that that's secure. I typically spend too much time doing stuff like this, but that's just part of how I tie. Um, that little extra piece of securing this 
flappy piece down completely unnecessary but the the coming back around and over allows you to get that allows you to catch it and then clip it close and control where you are cutting it off as opposed to trying to to come back around the rabbit strip from in front and then you end up pulling some stuff in and it's just it's kind of a mess so fun tip there There really isn't a formula with these, especially since you can and should vary your build. Um, partially to explore as a, a tire and then also to explore the impact on the water. And very important part of tying this bug is going out and fishing it and I do not exaggerate at all in saying that to this day this I mean, just last week it was a you know it was a big changer but put it in the water took a couple big strips let it get wet casted it again a couple more strips Took it off, put it back in the box. When you start getting to flies that swim, they require thought. And even if you put thought and time in at the vise, uh, sometimes it's just not right. So you get to go back and do it over. Or, you know, with the changers, you go back and add a little here, take some off there. But you do have to go fish it. Understand what it is that you specifically are looking for. What you got right, what you didn't, and then uh, this middle one is a 15, 15, 20 millimeter shank. 25 starts to get a little long um, for the smaller. For the minis. I like to come pretty far back there. I will occasionally after I tie this, move all this stuff forward, move all this stuff back, and, and put some little dabs of UV again, likely. It doesn't do a whole lot and might be more trouble than it's worth, but I, I'd prefer this to not roll over at all. Holy hell. And it's kind of hard to get Red wraps all the way back in there. Up next, more polar chenille. I tend to, I'm, I'm tying this in um, the way that I'm going to wrap it. So I'm tying it in like this as opposed to like this. And I, <clears throat> excuse me, I don't like to, actually that's a little far up, or excuse me, far back for me. I don't like to start that far back. This polar chenille is that long. So if I start all the way back here, it's just, it ends, it ends up killing the motion of the tail just a little bit because you have so much more material coming over the back. You also, since this back, I really, I don't wrap super, I wrap tightly, but I don't wrap super close together on these. So you can control the density 
and, and what ends up being bulk of these segments by how close you wrap the, the chenille. So I'll go real close on these, but I do want to start it a little higher up. Just to give that back hook a little wiggle room. And also on the, the back hook, not super focused on making sure all the fibers are not caught. It, it's kind of a, I'm not going to say intentionally sloppy, but if a couple of these little pieces of flash are mashed down on the back, I'm less concerned about that. Um, I, I start to become a little more particular in the front or moving up, and, and that's just allowing all of these fibers to stand up and out is going to give this section more bulk, which helps in the fat, skinnier, skinniest taper. So again, chenille, Coming back around under, wrapping on top, thread up and over, that's locked in. And you're not, you know, when I cut this off, You're, you're not cutting half of this stuff off and you're not leaving, you know, a big hunk. Uh, on a one-off basis, not a big deal, but I believe a Kelly Gallup quote, sweat the small stuff, be happy with the end product. It's true. I have historically gotten kind of sneaky or fancy with how I put rabbit on. If I'm putting the whole strip on and palmering, I like that base there. So we're gonna go around back. Oops. Rabbit in the back. All right, I'm gonna restart this so in, in the event you're following along here. Um, 
you don't do what I just did, which was to forget the a palmer of rabbit on the rear end. All right, so back hook, this guy, 15 millimeter, 20, 25 starts to get a little long for the, the minis or the semi minis. So around, and then with this thread, it's coming in front so that I can come up and over with my thread, come through that rabbit. That's tight, and it's getting tighter since I'm wrapping in the same direction as I'm palmering. I can get in close, clip off. Stuff all over my lap again. On this middle section, this is sort of just a, a theme throughout tying. The back section, I somewhat intentionally, it's not like I'm intentionally, you know, wrapping over itself with this, but I'm not worried about it. And I'm not, these aren't, you know, right next to each other. Get down. On this middle section, I'm going to be wrapping tight, as always, but um, I'm going to be coming right up next to the previous wrap and making sure that all of these fibers are standing up. In a good way, if you're getting tangled up a little bit, one, use a shorter piece. Um, two, just do a little bit of that before you go into wrap. Chenille, same deal. This is hanging now. I'm, I'm wrapping up and around. Coming forward. That's locked in. And again, continues to get tighter as I wrap forward. And I'm not leaving a half piece there or a, a half chunk there. I do find myself picking and choosing about when I decide to be particular or fancy, whatever you want to call it, about how I'm tying. And with rabbit, you know, I would cut an angle and tie it on. Um, if I'm palmering an entire strip around, I like to have that that base there because it allows me to really, with a little bit of super glue, a couple of thread wraps, it allows me allows me to really make sure that is super tight again wrap it in front of the thread around back this up and over that's locked in Pile of flash. At this point, I will occasionally throw in something darker, some black holographic, or just a little more krennic. I also like to do a little bit of this jabber. So tying in the butts, I'm just kind of doing a reverse tie. A 
it's just there's a little bit of prop there. That's a little too long. Going back and covering. Covering the hook itself. I get to go about halfway back on the shank, which when you're tying with a size six B10S is it's not it's not going back that far. Now, having fished a lot of flies with mallard flanks, catching a good number of fish, and really the hardest thing on flies that are fished by me and by people in my boat is the sportiness with which casts are made. So going into trees and getting ripped out and getting stuck on stuff and... Um, the, the mallard flanks themselves are, they're up with bucktail in terms of how durable they are. And obviously if you're getting in and, and, and pulling against the grain, you can rip them off easily, but you know, once they're down and they are swimming, I'll cut to the point. The failure point is the tie-in. More often than not. Way more often than not. That's a little funky. This one's coming up a little bit. So, just mash it down. That's about right. So they break off because of the tie-in point, um, not not because they are the feathers themselves are brittle. That's just a little UV flex, and then bonus option here, toothpick bobbin. Bonus option here is to give them a little. Bend them out a little bit, let that material breathe in the middle. I like this flash to be longer than that chenille flash. 
So it's, it's just these, the way I view this is, is very similar to the Crelex and, and, you know, Chuck Kraft and, and that time video is saying, you know, when you cut it cleanly, you get these flash points that are so abrupt. Um, that's kind of my default, but I, you know, I also, I really can't tie the exact same. Like this one's a little more tapered and staggered. So not a whole lot of science there, but I do like it to be above or shorter than the mallard flank in the back. And, and, and the point of that is that when this is wet and it's swimming like this, it's hidden until you get the tick sideways and it's pop. All this comes out on the kill. And then to have that be a different length than the chenille, um, it's just more flash points. This is a size one. This is gonna get a little funky because that's, that's where I'm at today. The rattles that I'm using are pretty big. Well, they're very big. Um, just off of Amazon, but you know, hairline, whatever. Look up plastic rattles on Amazon. They come in packs of 25 and they have a little worm, you know, an adjustment to, to throw onto your, your jig. I'll clip that off. It, it can cause a little bit of a hole to form there. So a little bit of epoxy and then this, um, just some UV. And then this front part also can be loose on some of them. So I'll throw in some, some bone dry right there too. Wire is an interesting one. I like, unless it's too big to go into the rear hook or it impedes motion, I like the 024 um, 7 or 19 or whatever 49 is fine it's just so 49 is just doesn't make any sense to me to buy that when this works just fine and it's you know 10 times the cost so 024 and then small 4 millimeter beads Fives work okay. I'll show you the why I like the, the bigger wire with the smaller beads and the seven strand. It's because it's it's not super bendy. I'm gonna bone dry this. So this is also, I'm preparing for the, the rattle application. I'm coming on the side there. Coming through my three beads, the three fours, um, or two fives. Kind of just depends on what you have easily accessible, apparently. But on, on these A-Racks, it's got more of a stinger bend as opposed to the, the Aberdeen. So there's just, it's almost like you lose this first one. This is less important than when you're tying two or when you're tying the, the standard because you, you want enough of a hook gap between this point and this bend and that point in the back. When you have a shank in the middle, this becomes a little less important and more about either your own habits 
um, or just what you like to see in a fly. So here I'm, I'm coming in straight, straight on top to keep this back loop straight. These four millimeter beads have an inside diameter that is small enough so that they won't, they won't pinch back onto that eye, shank eye, hook eye, whatever it is. And what I'm doing there is just putting some thread wraps around the wire itself, give it a little more rigidity. And you bet. A little bit of super glue on the, the nylon coated wire, just like any plastic that it just becomes a permanent chemical bond. And so from there, coming back from that straight tie, and then I'm going to come back over on the side. If I don't get all the way there, that's going to be okay. This becomes kind of my marker for where I'm going to stop tying stuff in, which we'll get to. But you do want to force yourself. When I'm bending the wire back, I like to stop you know, a couple thread wraps back. So create that, that little locking part right there. And then come back here so that you, when you bend, bend this back, you can catch it. And the reason I'm doing the three layers of wire here is so that my rattle can sit prim and proper up top and then I use the the chenille to sort of fill in what I need so th this is going to be a little higher than this back bend here I'm not going to sit here and encourage tying back onto the bend of a hook but that's what I'm doing Just gonna do one wrap here. I'll occasionally do two, but this is a this is a healthy bunny. As I move up into the front, I, I like to, you know, if I can fit two in, if it makes sense, it's just that that little extra bulk that if you find ways to do that throughout the fly as you're moving forward you're going to end up with a better taper. So finding ways to be skinnier in the back and then finding ways to make just little adjustments to, to increase the taper up front. Like that. I'm going to be happy with that extra little flappy piece. Some days, that might bother me, and I would cut it off. For whatever reason, it's not today. And here, my one wire wrap on this side is a little lower down. So I'm using this the base of the chenille to kind of fill in and even out on the other side to give my rattle a nice fat platform. Super important with glass, which they're just going to break. Um, one of the reasons that I enjoy tying and fishing so much is that there's no way just based on 
what I've done and having been so happy with certain flies and then looking back and, and saying that's, that wasn't it. That was definitely not it. Um, this won't be it next year. You know, there's going to be something else that I, I like to do. So there was a time where I liked the glass and I'm not going to defend that at all. Plastic rattles are better. So you have your base of nylon thread and plastic coated wire, plastic rattle. This big gap back here and why I said this is going to get funky with the small hook is so that I can have this rattle come back and sit over the beads. And it's going to give me space up front. But yeah, creating that big base is just, otherwise you have your rattle sitting on top of a hook shank. And the only way it's going to break or dislodge is because it's just on that hook shank and, and the tie-in points, especially if I'm having this hang off the back like that. Um, it's just, it, there's not a lot of stuff for it to be secure on. I've become increasingly liberal with my use of super glue in general and increasingly spare, sparing. I use it more sparingly. I don't use it as much on the rattle. You know, I used to coat the whole thing, but after getting that onto the back, making sure these back two are super tight, the rest of this, the, the diameter is so much bigger. The diameter that you're wrapping around here is so much bigger than the stuff in the back that, you know, you, you can be very careful about getting all of these things touching. Um, but the more you, the more gaps you leave, the more exposure that rattle is going to have. I also, that it does make a difference with the sound leaving that rear end exposed. But you don't need to come to, as long as you're wrapping tightly, again, this is just wrapping around a diameter that's, you know, five times as big as these shanks on that back hook. You're getting so much more chenille and bulk in each one of these wraps that you don't need to go crazy with the density. If, if this space, if you end up with a little gap here, I would encourage you to do this. When you, when you start putting that type of all those different little layers of stability and durability. I guess me personally, I, I fish it with so much more. I just, I know what goes into this. So I fish it with so much more confidence. And, and I, I give it to people and tell them to fish it and have it get jammed into a log. And, you know, if they're not getting it out, I'm taking the rod and fishing 16 or 20 pound fluoro, you know, trying to either snap the fluoro or move the log or get the fly back. And I'm not worried about the fly at all. I'm worried about the hook points at that stage. This is where things can get pretty wonky. If you don't stop yourself, I'm 
little bit of flash. Again, I'm stopping myself there. And if you can see a, a tinge to my fingers, it's because they're dyed. Chartreuse, bright chartreuse. I dig it. And just to be a complete lunatic and irritate some people with OCD, the front section is going to be left tapered. I am going to put in more Krennic, though, because I like that stuff. And, as mentioned, there's a little bit of bulk, so... Adding a little more bulk and a little bit of a darker highlight, low light, I don't know if that's correct, on the front. Um, I, I'm, I'm in space saving mode at this point, so getting that first wrap around and then Bob is our uncle. Flanks up on the side. I forgot something that I like to do. which is add some big lateral scale. And this is going to end up being behind the mallard flank and then when stripping covered by the rabbit I like to leave it a little long. I'll, I'll probably cut that down. Cause I, I, I kind of like it hanging out of the side to get some flash the whole time. I, I am a big fan. Big fan of the flash. But most of it is going to be covered by stuff. Until you kill it, that rabbit moves forward and you, and you get these giant pots of flash. And this time I'm putting the brighter orange camera side on that. Wrapping this down and then leaving my thread in the back here. More super glue. And this this bunny dam is important. That's one full wrap around, still leaving that thread behind it. Super glue. It's it's gonna vary. Um, I'm gonna be good with two here, just because this is you know with with thick with a healthy bunny, 
uh, or with bunny boo. It just, it depends on the, the rabbit strip you're using. I'll go three. Um, on the bigger ones, you know, more shank space, smaller rattle. Um, you know, you can or, or smaller strips. The micro strips, those things are awesome. Um, the barred, barred groovy bunny. Whew. So this is all, this is around back here. So just fluff that bunny out. Take this thread up and around. And you can catch that, catch that little hanger there if you want. I do like to fluff that out a little bit. Get my, my water bowl. And put a little bit of flex. With super glue and those thread wraps. The super glue, you know, rabbit, rabbit hide on rabbit hide. That's why I saturated it. That that is like a one piece at this point. The reason I like to do this is so that when I'm cutting, uh, I don't have to worry about clipping into this or cutting off this stuff right here. It's on the bottom, you want to come in real tight. Boop. Bone dry works. That rabbit fur and Flex or <clears throat> UV flex are pretty friendly together. Bone dry just ends up, you know, like you can lose control of it. Um, 100 strand, I, I kind of like the 150. 200 can feel a little, a little bulky for the smaller ones, but. Um, I really don't mind the, the 150 or the 200. You just have to be. Be cognizant of how many wraps you're putting in uh, on your deer hair. So up top, that's where you want your first tie. And that keeps things right sized. I think we're gonna go hot, hot collar. I like to go pretty big on this first tie. If it ends up being too bulky, I push it around and spin it. And then I cut off the bottom. Got a comb attached to my table here. find myself using the hair stacker less and less, but we'll make this pretty.
So this helps with taper and swim. It also helps with the, the buoyancy and the right sizing. So aesthetically to, to come back right on that collar, right on that rabbit collar, it, it looks nice. Um, you know, I, I don't think coming back here would be a problem. That that's going to be a problem, I would say. It just doesn't give you even with this one. And actually, that's pretty pretty air filled belly, so it, it's going to end up being fine. Um, but that that could use a little bit, a little bit more coming back, and also just a little. A little bit of a thicker tie on that one. Hundred strand with a big old bunch of belly hair is just just begging to be snapped through. So that's two, and it's it's starting to come down at that angle. So I'm just gonna go with that and come back over the front and, and wrap some of that in. And at that point, it's it's tight, not really moving. Um, so I'm gonna start massaging that back a little bit. Gets pretty fingery up in these parts. I'm, I'm applying a good degree of tension as I'm doing this. The next part is you're leaving this piece of hair unfinished. Coming around the bottom wiggling the whole time. You don't want to be catching Catching threads. That was two or three wraps in there. Keeping tension the whole time. We're back. So, left that unfinished. Came around, put in two or three whips in front. Little super glue. You can use whatever you want. Pen, fingers. Pat Cohen's tool. And those whips, I'm just creating, it, it's almost like a thread dam. I'm creating some bulk there. That become really strong with super glue. And then I'm cinching it. And as I cinch it, it's pushing back up into the deer hair. And tying with deer hair when you're when you're doing this when you're you know pushing stuff back, I'm not going to say packing, stacking, packing, but spinning and packing. You you put a little bit of a, a layer there. You tie your hair on that it, it affixes to that layer of thread, and then a couple whips in front of it. And what you're doing is pushing that thread back up into the next piece and then that thread dam in front of it is is securing it up there so that's good and tight uh we will do some black some red oh
of brown. The smaller your spins are, the easier this is going to be. So you really want to limit yourself to between two and three wraps of thread per spin. It's not going to get tighter by putting more wraps in, it's actually going to get looser. And you're not stacking this for, for overall bulk because what you're going to end up doing is shaving everything down except for you know really close to the hook shank on the, on the front or on the top and the bottom so that was two around just making sure it's and this is that you know i, I would see people do this on time videos i'm like what is going on definitely just cut through some there i'm okay with that So I just got those two around and then I'm, I'm manually you know, spinning it. And really at that point, I'm spinning enough around so that I can come up from the bottom in front without catching a big chunk. A couple turns in front whips just to get it secure miss one or two catch the GSP on my finger snap it off lose my mind all right so that's that's secure now making sure it's even I was just doing a little bit of that Checking it out. You are, of course, ideally, you know, getting your spin and having it spin all the way around and flare and do all that stuff. But when you start to get in real tight up front, it doesn't spin. And if it is spinning, you're not getting you're not getting enough hair in there. So to get that in there and then, you know, mash it around manually, recognizing that again, you're going to be lopping this off real close on the top and the bottom. So you don't need to worry too much. You, I mean, you want it to be symmetrical, but um, it, symmetry is really important when you're looking at the, the Dahlbergs where it's, it, it's the bulk, the entire fly stacking up mass with deer hair um yeah i'll walk that back symmetry is important you do want to make sure this is all the way spun around but you, you can do that with your fingers you don't have to worry about doing that with the thread so there were three or four more wraps in there three or four more whips i'm just building up that dam in front this is just like letting a drop of super glue out and then sucking it back in after it touches the thread.
since you are going to be sculpting the sides, sculpting the sides a little bit, you want to start with long hair. The longer and the straighter, be it body, be it belly, longer, straighter, more rigid that you can get, the easier the carving process is going to be. If you're having trouble finding deer hair, I mean, the first thing to do is go to the local fly shop and just sort through because they, they will have some. Um, the next thing to do is look up. I don't think Pat Cohen is still selling his select belly hair, but that's, you know, it's like four bucks or five bucks, maybe more for a pack of hair that, you know, they normally run three or whatever, 275. But the hit rate on the 275s or the threes is, is you know, one in 10. And the stuff Pat is, you know, I've, I've gotten a bunch from him and the hit rate there is like 95% and you're getting, all this stuff is now, I'm just, I'm dying my own and getting belly hair from deer um when i go do tails but yeah getting it from pat um and then i think saint marie's flies but yeah there are there are some some places that do specialty and it's worth it it's worth spending twice as much when you know you're gonna get something versus you know spending money that literally it just goes out the window because it's it's not usable so this last one is going to be getting real tight in there. I'm around the eye, coming back around, going going down. And I, I think I still have the close up on the YouTube channel. This one's really, I mean that that was that is not going to get around the hook unless. I do that. So once I can see that hook eye sneaking through. Up and around, wiggling, wiggling as you go. Two or three wraps on the eye because I'm going to slip off. There were two as I try to get around that. A couple whips. That's less of the thread dam there and more of the securing this in sure I'm, I'm still moving that brown hair a little bit now i'm just gonna put just a little bit that's just on the hook eye and then using my thread that I lost at some point. There we are. Using my thread to, um, that's where the super glue is, right on that eye, and I'm just bringing it back into the rest of that GSP. And so all of these wraps, even though they're not whips, are gonna be locking in. And then for fun, I'll do a couple. Couple whips there. Uh, you can cut off and trim at this point. I like to do one more. A 
one more pack. And then I can see a little bit of thread there. Here I'll put in another couple, three, four, five, six. Some whip finishes. Um, and then a, a dab of super glue before before I go real tight on that, and that'll just create a a bomb proof thread dam that is too much and it's all up in the eye. Not a huge deal, but keep some paper towels handy. So those whips are yet to be cinched, and now they're covered in super glue. And so you at that point, cinched back, and that's doing both a secure thread dam and also giving it one last little pack, and then some OCD. Boop. Mash. Mash. Make sure all that hair is splayed. Right at the eye. Just get on in there. And you know there's two layers of rabbit. So if you're just barely seeing that top, you can you can keep cutting down in there. As long as you get the general shape here, this does not have to be perfect. I, I spent too much time trying to get these things to be perfect. It, it's more important to just work on general shapes and, and width and um, making sure that bottom's close and getting a, a tight cut from the top. And by tight cut, I mean coming up from that hook eye. If you are going to be in the Midwest area at any point in time, Tommy is, I have the opportunity to fish with him. He's an excellent guide and just one of those, you know, you, you want someone who invented a fly like this to end up being being a nice dude and being fishy and he is that so do yourself a favor and look him up um, in Michigan top Bottom, mostly even. Getting there. If things are looking uneven, come in on the sides there. I'm, I'm just, I'm going right to the eye. Because I'm, I'm losing with that hair flaring out. I'm losing the ability to see 
what's even and what's not. cutting with the dull razor when I have a bunch of it. I, I did. I do. They're here. So a little wide for my taste right now, but I, I like to get you know get that shape. Make sure the eye is even, which can sometimes mean you're clearing it. So that way I can see which side has more hair, which side has less. Once you come in tight on the eye, so right, right from here, that's the part that is driving the dip. I don't have to listen to Tommy talk about it, but it matters very little what is behind that as far as what, what the initial action is. Um, some of this, you know, you'll see people with rounded edges or a pointier now, uh, I, I just, that front should be tight, and then you, I'll show you how to cheat just a little bit. Or something just barely off and it doesn't matter so get this on wait a few minutes and then you can pinch those front pieces to make it a, a super sharp edge I like to coat the whole thing just because it makes the deer hair stick together but because the deer hair is this in particular is so dry and full of air this Sally Hansen is going to get sucked up in there and then You just give it a little, if you can actually shape it a little bit. 
get that front real crisp. So wait a few minutes, let it dry. Um, it, it's going to dry, you know, there's air moving around there and there's air in that, the deer hair itself. So it's, it's going to dry. I'm going to just put this stuff on in the interest of my own sanity. Gel super glue is recommended here, but it doesn't really matter because we're going to coat this with a little bit of UV. Now for this one, since I went pretty thin on that, that cut job, I'm going to do a little resin at the eye. And then some on the eyes themselves. And have that sort of spill over to the sides. And after everything dries up and, and hardens and I have more of a platform, I'll, I might do another little layer there. And then one right in the bottom where there, you can see I, I caught a, I don't mind getting liberal on the bottom. On the bigger heads or on the less crisp cut jobs, I'll be a little more loose with the UV. Um, it, it reduces the overall buoyancy. And the Sally Hansen's, once it dries, the deer hair retains some of its flexiness. So, you know, these these front pieces might flare out a little bit and um, it just, to me, there's, there's a little bit of a better swim when this isn't like super, super crisp and tight, which it can be a start and, and it'll look like this when it's dry, but after you fish it, if you're just using the Sally Hansen's as opposed to coating these edges with UV, it, it'll allow that hair to sort of get out and breathe a little bit. So she wrote, tie it, fish it, watch Tommy's stuff, watch Schultz's stuff. Um, try to fish with Tommy if you can. Try to fish with me if you can. But th this one is, it really, it taught me so much about tying with intention, tying deer hair with intention, what you can do with deer hair, what the impact of, you know, all the spacing does and and taper and all that it, it really is I, I make it a little more complex than it needs to be but the bare bones you know just just the ingredients put onto the hooks in in the correct way and um you know experimenting with the head you'll start seeing some pretty cool stuff happen pretty quickly enjoy <laughs>